So um, in the uh, second session today, uh, we will um, kind of have a brief recap of what we uh, uh, went through yesterday. We saw as to how one uh, kind of uh, assembles the OCT machine, I mean the OCT catheter and how one starts. I had told uh, that it, it's always nice to get oriented to the different functions which this machine offers, apart from uh, the of uh, uh, getting the uh, OCT procedure right in case where what's important is to know all the four uh, pieces you need to prepare the catheter um, I, in terms of uh, first so whenever you take out the catheter don't be in a hurry to connect it to the dock you must purge it otherwise it will not uh, calibrate so contrast your contrast is used for purging the 3cc syringe wait for three drops to come once this has been done you activate the catheter with a wet cause piece the hydrophilic coating is activated and uh, then it has a terminal run you connect it it gets calibrated you do a pinch test to see if this is function and then once all this is done you're you have a guiding catheter in place and the coronary wire across so you then position so if it's a tight lesion you need to pre-dilate once you position you purge again and then once you're ready for the acquisition you must puff that to see that the guide catheter is coaxial and once you puff and see that the clearance is pretty good now you're the uh, pull back so just remember the four piece position purge puff and uh, back very important and also want to see different morphologies and how how different uh, terms and there were questions as to how to orient it to uh, the different lesion morphology. i had answered in a very simple manner that do three or four or five cases and master the uh, technique uh, we also studied some bit of angiocortion and uh, some bit of uh, how one can acquire the images in a very it's a very user-friendly machine and it's pretty easy and use and you'll uh, master it so um, what uh, the major lesion is I had uh, noted. So uh, I mean, we have you, we generally use, uh, backscatter and attenuation two things because it's a light light based technology. So if you have a backscatter, the lesion is going to appear very bright. And you also look for attenuation. And if the inner dark lesion, if the attenuation is low and it has got very sharp edges, it is heterogeneous. Then what you have is calcium, how it looks very sleep, well defined. And if one has seen a calcific plaque in a coronary, one will never uh, forget because it really looks beautiful uh, there. But in case you have very high attenuation, that means the light which is going through is absolutely not uh, getting reflected back, completely absorbed. Since it is getting completely, there will be no edges of the uh, plaque which, and it appears homogeneous. It's, it's a dark patch, then you are dealing with a lipid plaque can see between uh, three o'clock and six o'clock position in the slide uh, what is depicted is a lipid block well if the attenuation is very very low that means the light is getting completely reflected back and it is absolutely homogeneous then you're dealing with a fibrous block so the fibrous block reflects all the light back it is really bright you know if you compare the three dresses appearing the brightest but um, when we apply OCT to a given coronary lesion, we need to follow an M. And I, I think you all are doing OCT, so you are very well with the new algorithm we are using these days, which is called the MLD Max. What that means, so for any, you need to have a strat strategy in place. First part of the OCT or the pre PCI OCT is to strategize. Strat basically implies that you need to study the lipology. You need to have the diameters in place and measure the length of the lesion. So to know all this, you will select your tools for plaque preparation and you will select the right uh, size balloon and the of completing your job. So once you stand, you go ahead and implant the stent. And once you've implanted the stent, as you know, we all use drug eluting stents and you would like the drug to onto the surface of the vessel and not get washed. So you need to optimize. For optimization, you do OCT and this is where you have the algorithm max where still dissection, A for opposite tension. So it basically implies you need to leave any complications behind and you need the well opposed and well expanded. So as we, uh, in the first part, I'll be dealing with MLD max. And in the second part of this session with some cases which were done using uh, in this algorithm so m for morphology and d for the, uh, uh, the diameter and medial dissection apposition and uh, expansion so let's look at, um, the uh, different digital uh, subsets where uh, we read the oct so the index example here is that of a calcified lesion because uh, we have calcium is one uh, lesion subset or calcified plaque is one lesion subset which is associated with the under expansion and if you um, ask me uh, the medical literature is full of examples majority of the stent failures occurs in my lesions because you're, you're leaving the stent under so under expansion is enemy number one for the uh, stent failure so you assess the morphology and see if it is a calcified plaque what is the extent of calcification in terms of the arc of in terms of its thickness and the length 
So uh, this is very, very important because you will then accordingly choose different uh, tools to assess. The um, length of the lesion is equally uh, important and so is the uh, diameter. So we had discussed yesterday that we need uh, EL-based measurements and this is what ILUMIN3 taught us because ILUMIN was based on the uh, lumen-based diameter wherein they found that these are a little smaller. So ILUMIN3 study used EL-based uh, uh, diameter assessment of the vessel and the results were pretty optimal. So we will, as we go down, we'll be seeing through the case sample as to how one uses the uh, uh, paste uh, diameter for the heart variation. Um, I mentioned this, that calcification of the predominant morphology on the pre-PCI OCT and change of strategy has been required. And this is what from the light lab and from the other studies. Well, pre-PCI evaluation involves, you know, certain other things. So, uh, check you will get patients who are interested, so you need to check whether the extent of remodeling of uh, the um, IS and um, uh, you, you know various acute stent related complications and someone some failure stent failure whether there is some amount of sclerosis which is ha happening and if you are doing a de novo lesion a bifurcation lesion then you have certain parameters which you will check the renal tip angle the origin of the side branch is the side branch ostium as to how the maze opposite the side branch origin whether there is a plug burden or uh, what if there is calcium, what is the extent and distribution of calcium. And you would, of course, uh, need to know uh, your landing zones because you want them to be free of any uh, plug or uh, calcium. So it, it's really important to look at all these factors uh, while you are uh, planning your or strategizing your angioplasty. So in a very simple term, if I have to summarize this, is that you when you do the OCT, you look for the change in the OCT image as to where is the change taking. Uh, if you are in a position to identify intima, media, and adventitia, then you are dealing with either a normal vessel or with a fibrous plug. So, identify all the three structures with either of these two uh, things. Um, thereafter, you if there is some abnormality, you have to use the abnormality located. If the abnormality is located in the lumen and the attenuation, then it's a red thrombus. If the abnormality is located in the lumen, low attenuation, that means the light can go all across, then you're dealing with a white thrombus. If the problem is in the vessel wall with high attenuation, that means being completely absorbed, you're dealing with a lipid plug. And if there is low attenuation in the vessel, you're dealing with a calcific uh, plug. So basic algorithm tells you to identify the abnormality in the vessel wall. It could be either a lipid or a calcific plug. And if it's in the lumen, then it's either a red or the thrombus. Well, coronary calcium uh, is very, very important. I have always stressed on coronary calcium. The coronary calcium could be deep or shall in either of the situations, it could be thick or uh, uh, thick. And uh, if you see the thick calcium, it appears deep thick calcium is not of a major problem. You can use cutting balloon. You can use other balloons and the stretching is a short. And uh, same is the case with thin calcium. It does not basically change your stuff uh, stenting. It's a superficial which troubles. And if you have a superficial uh, thin plate uh, calcium, to worry at all and you can easily deal with it and but if you have layer calcium superficial nodular calcium then it is trouble and if it is circumferential then the problem is uh, more because in that case you need to have some debulking strategy with you you uh, move from superficial side with deep or the nodular uh, calcium you need to have some debulking uh, in uh, place we also use calcium scoring i will not go into the details of this so if you are oriented and we've had multiple webinars based on this u0 to 4 i mean it basically tells you the extent distribution of calcium so extent assessed in terms of thickness and arc and distribution into length so there are multiple ways one which assesses more the calcium more is the need for you know, the plaque uh, preparation uh, required because you will otherwise not be assured of good stent uh, expansion. So in general, when we are strategizing, let's see spectrum, you can have some moderate or high calcium. If it is low calcium, you have a lipid and a fibrotic plug, moderate calcium, you still will do angioplasty without atherectomy devices. So uh, this is how it goes. So as the content, as the amount of calcium is, you need more atherectomy devices. You need to go to rotational atherectomy and base IVL is another tool which is uh, very, very friendly and uh, ablates the calcium in a, in a manner that it gives you very, very optimal uh, stent expansions. I will just load on my fan. I think it's making a lot of noise. Just give me a second. Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, once you've uh, gone through the lesion, you need to assess the proximal and distal uh, uh, reference. And thereafter, you can assess the lesion length. And when you look at the proximal and distal reference, you always have to look at the EEL. I told you, we look at EEL and do all the measurements. So we have a lot of case examples of uh, this over time. So the diameter is based on EEL. 
if you do an EEL based diameter, you have to round it down to the nearest 10. If you do a lumen based assessment, then you have to round it. So I, I, I will um, re be repeating nauseam as we go down and when we function where we are going to deal with the uh, examples. So round up and round down on a lumen based measurement. And when we do lumen based measurement, the EEL is not visible. If the vessel is uh, diffuse, if you have a calcified uh, vessel, is a situation where you have a fibrocalcific plaque at this end. Uh, so in these situations, you have no choice. Even in the left main segment, the OCT of the left main is around four millimeters or more. You'll not be able to see the EL at all because the penetration is not very high. So you will have to do this measurement and then uh, round it up to the nearest uh, stand site. Uh, this shows just the same thing. You have um, the uh, lumile on top. You have the longitudinal mode, and now you have the uh, selected cut. Uh, cross section uh, images. Now, the most important thing is that whenever you choose a distal reference site, we at least be able to see 180 degrees of tri structure. So, this, if you if you can see, this is good enough for you to do the measurements. And when you measurements, you have to do two perpendicular uh, length. Make the mean of that. You should avoid lipid laden, as you can see here. There's a lot of lipid here uh, in, in between, say around six o'clock to eleven o'clock position. So you are of uh, stentage uh, dissection if you tend ends here or else even if the dissection does not you will certainly have a geographical uh, miss and the patient will uh, come back now the all the calculations uh, the machine does an automated assessment you will get the cross-sectional area of the distal and the proximal reference and machine will already identify and in a yellow box it will give you in the minimal luminal area and where it is located so you have kind of orientation uh, of the lesion and it's all done in or second. So you get wealth of information which you can uh, utilize in your uh, angioplasty procedure. Now, strategize, we go on now to optimize our stents. And optimization essentially involves, um, you know, looking at whether we produce any uh, dissection. Now, I had mentioned yesterday that uh, a signification is one which is visible angiographically. On OCT, it has to be extending one quarter, that means more than a 60 degrees, extend down into the media or longitudinally more than uh, two millimeters. If you notice any of this, then you additional uh, stent. Now, it is uh, really, really important when you are using drug eluting stents, we want the drug to get onto the surface of the vessel and not get uh, into the blood and uh, the body through urine. So you to see that your stent is well opposed and malopus diagnosed if your stent is more than uh, micron away from the vessel wall and the longitudinal extent is more than two mm. Very often a West main angioplasty is very short segments of malaposition. These can easily be left among without uh, any uh, uh, post dilatation of uh, these malaposition as long as they meet this criteria that means between the stent and the vessel wall is less than three uh, micron and the longitudinal extent is uh, in uh, three millimeters. Now these are programmable parama machine and you can go ahead and program so it, there'll be some indicators which, and I'll show you during the case examples. As you have planned, so will the machine automatically give you the information that okay, as per your programming, we have uh, found that there is some amount of issue. But the most important thing is need to expand your stent well. And if you leave an under stent back there, then be, be rest assured that this patient is going to come back to you. So as per the consensus document, we go in for expansion of more than percent of the uh, reference uh, segment. This is what is acceptable. Um, percent has been considered to be optimal. Ilumin 4 is more than 90%. This is 90% came from the MUDI, which was an essentially an IVAS based study, but it has been seen that achieving 90% expansion at times becomes really, really difficult, and especially when you have calcified uh, plaques. So, in these scenarios, I percent is a very, very reasonably acceptable limit of stent uh, expansion. So, um, you need to kind of uh, use different gadgets. I think the most important thing I always advocate is the bed preparation because you would not thereafter have to waste a lot of energy post tenting in using high pressure balloons. Well, in addition to detection of the um, stent edge dissection, the, the OCT also picks up the platen. It can tell you about if there is any geographical um, and if you're already stented vessel, if there is the stenosis, what is the extent of risk? You can ex assess the stent uh, thrombosis. We have uh, stent thrombosis, and towards the end of this uh, talk, we'll be, I'll be touching on uh, these things. And stent very, very important. So um, is uh, an example of uh, the medial dissection and is extending right down to the media at the stent edge. This 
is visible in the cross-sectional image, also visible in the longitudinal image. You can see that there, which is there. So uh, oh, oh, it's all, it's very well defined in the cross-sectional image, but in the longitudinal image, you can detect the uh, medial uh, dissection. Now, case example of uh, malaposition, and you can see that this this is the red comes in the lumen profile, which I was telling you. Particularly, tell you as to where the stent is malo, the line becomes red. If this is red, then you are sure that the stent is very well. The cross-sectional images, the stent starts with red. So this is what is seen from say about one o'clock clock position. It's white, whereas the rest of the stent is kind of uh, not opposed to the vessel wall. And as per the definition of malaposition, which you fed in the machine, which is um, less than uh, 300 uh, micron and more than three millimeters in length. It has detected this man and you need to correct it. Similarly, you can have um, under expansion and there is a machine again use it a tool tells you and identifies the places where the stent is uh, under expanded. So it's different models and you can uh, uh, we can't. and under expansion is enemy number one. And so you need to be very, very sure that the stent uh, well expanded. Now this you have a dual method as well as the tapered uh, method. We come to all that with the case examples. I would not waste time. Now, we have, uh, you know, um, the West, we are all are aware we do a lot of bifurcation, all of us do a lot of bifurcation stenting. And we know that as the size keeps coming out, the um, the vessel tapers down. So there is a kind of relationship between the side branch and the main uh, vessel. And the vessel tapers predominantly to the size of the side branch. So you have more side branches coming out. The vessel taper is going to be much, much uh, faster. And um, the European Bifurcation Club, uh, you know, we uh, vociferously are advocating. And we now have a lot while doing the bifurcation uh, stent that um, as the side branch comes, the kind of step down. And we always select the stent diameters based on the uh, uh, distal vessel uh, diameter. So Hukasov model is uh, the one which is used predominant doing the bifurcation. Uh, so I, I told you there are two scenarios. You have a third where you have a proximal and distal reference and you feel that there's a natural uh, and you can uh, use this so that you have a proximal, you have a distal reference and uh, the machine is going to act in the stent expansion uh, for you. Becomes a problem when there is a sudden, if you can see the uh, image and uh, three, which there, there are multiple uh, side branches coming out, it becomes very difficult to apply this tapered method, which looks very optimal in the uh, image, the very gradual. So you have a dual method, divide the vessel into two halves, the proximal half, still half. So for, and then we'll uh, do automatically. Now, if you go to the menu and you can select uh, from the menu option, you can select the uh, uh, either of the methods so that what happens then is that if I have stented from left main to distal LAD, then I would use the dual method. I cannot use the uh, one color reference. If I use the proximal reference, which is the left main size, still uh, stent, even though optimally expanded, will be shown by the machine expanded because it possibly cannot achieve the areas which the left main has achieved. So you divide the vessel into two halves, then the distal half and in the proximal reference. Uh, will be applicable only for the first half of the vessel. The expansion of the stent will be assessed based on the proximal reference size and uh, the distal reference will be applicable to the part of the stent, distal half of the stent, and uh, it works uh, there. So this is an example of a, a tapered uh, uh, reference. So what you can see is that um, you have of color coding which uh, happens along with the uh, in shown to be under expanded. So immediately on uh, your screen and profile, the under expanded segment will become red and cross under expansion. The thickness of this red line will increase. So it will become thicker. So it's kind of going to alert you that you are getting grossly under expanded. Um, it will be seen very well in your angioco registration picture. It's well expanded. The entire profile will be all white. And if it is an under expanded stay angioco uh, film also, it will become uh, red. Now, this is very, very important because when you put a balloon for uh, expanding the stent, you will have some anatomical correlates already with you. Like in this case, we know that proximal to the origin of the diagonal branch, the stent is grossly under, and we can go ahead and uh, treat this. Now, a very uh, popular figure which gives you almost all the different uh, cutoffs uh, which are used for uh, nosing uh, different. Uh, 
problems which uh, you encounter, which includes your sections, plot prolapse, under expansion, malaposition. So I, I mean, um, what I want to convey is that always select a site that you have a disease-free segment. Avoid uh, ending zones where the plot burden is more than uh, 50% or there are fibrocalcific blocks. You are then kind of assured of pension. If you have calcified segments, crack them before the stent become, becomes very, very difficult in a stented segment to crack the calcium. And as features are the most important predictors of optimal uh, stent uh, expansion. Um, try and avoid tissue which occur both in stable as well as in the ACS uh, situation. So your case example of the, that. And um, as possible, optimize your stents in the manner that you have uh, good uh, end results. Some OCT pictures of uh, Stent malapis here you can see between uh, say uh, three to uh, nine o'clock position the stent is absolute host. You have the image of an under expanded stent. Uh, this stent is uh, when the malaposition is circumferential we call it under expansion. You can have um, malaposition can occur even in a well expanded stent or an under expanded stent. So this is uh, something or action can also occur vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, malaposition. So in case of an edge uh, dissection, you have tissue prolapse where the tissue prolapses through the strand struts into the lumen. You have grading of grade one to four. In ACS situation, this is generally in. It is the thrombotic material, which is come as a slightly larger balloon and overcome this. In a chronic stable angina patient, if you have a lipidic uh, plaque product, this has been shown in studies to be a predictor ISR at that site. So if I have to have one tool which picks up all this OCT, it is much more sensitive to angiography I was so the surface detail uh, which OC2 are absolutely unmatched and it really tells you whether you've gone wrong uh, while optimizing your stent or whether you need anything more to you know see that this event free survival post angioplasty so uh, one can detect a geographical mess one can detect malin one can detect conduction one can detect tissue prolapse as well as HD all, all these are uh, things we up post uh, stenting and these which you need to assess uh, while doing different runs to see that you don't deeply have any of these which become the uh, nidus for stent failure uh, in a short span of uh, time. Now long term OCT is basically important to uh, detect stent failure. Now stent failure can occur early or it can occur um, very late whereas stent um, the timelines for it that means um, uh, these are all been um, and uh, society guided uh, and definition uh, definitions for them but stent thrombosis can occur at all the stages you know it is um, something which happens which can happen early late or it can happen uh, uh, re-stenosis is generally seen um, with the regulating stents um, six to nine months post implant whereas neoatherosclerosis with the DES occurs much earlier than the bms era so it starts by about half years and deaths have kind of um, increased the rate of sclerosis which we see. Now the factors responsible for the early complication or the early stent failure are the under expansion. I, and I need not stress this any further. I've been talking about this uh, since this you know, the session that don't leave an under expanded stent. If you leave behind uh, a vulnerable plaque, you have an stent edge dissection or you've gone very, very high and caused truck fractures. This uh, uh, can become an idus for uh, stent from early stent failure. Now, late and very late uh, stent failure essentially basic, basically due to uh, vessel reaction, again to under expansion and uh, man, whereas very late complications are linked to neoarthrosis and uh, plaque rupture. Now, yesterday, Mahurka sir had asked me about the of ISR, neoatherosclerosis, and thrombosis. So I put a couple of slides for that. I, I think we all know that it occurs in an uh, under-expanded stent. It generally is benign and it presents as, you know, a little angina. So whenever we do uh, for our patients at the end of six or nine months, we different them uh, for these symptoms if they are not forthcoming. Or if there is mild atypical symptoms, we subject them to test. Some of these patients with the bare metal stent also present with late stent thrombosis. So, or eye uh, lesion can, in about 25%, <laughs> can come with uh, late uh, stent thrombosis. So, what exactly is the link between ISR and late stent thrombosis? It is the neoatherosclerosis. So, the moment a patient develops um, ISR, then he goes on uh, neoatherosclerotic uh, changes, and it is the neoatherosclerotic plaque rupture which leads to late stent thrombosis. So OCT is really helpful in this also. You can have all these features can be picked up. 
So this is a case example of uncovered heat. At the end of six or nine months, these stents were stent struts were uncovered. This is probably because the endothelial did, did not grow over this. So this becomes if you stop the antiplatelets, it can become anidus or thrombus formation. So the patient can develop uh, stent thrombus. This picture shows you neoentomal uh, hyperplasia, one thing which happens when you put uh, more than two rings of stent. You can see two rings of stent here. The overlapping stent struts for more chances of uh, restenosis. Now, if this is this segment, now the white arrows that you can see has some lipid laden blocks. So, this is what is neoatherosclerosis. This is probably because the lipids are now getting deposited in this neoatherotic segment. And very rarely, in about 5 to 10 percent, you can have calcific neoentoma. Now, the entire thing is the calcium. It's a circumferential calcific neoentoma which you see on your screen, which is uh, come. So these are all attributes of stent failure. The stent has failed and you see a spectrum of changes uh, which are happening. And uh, are, uh, so this is called uh, the positive remodel causing uh, evagination of the struts. So the stent struts have, the vessel has grown out to and leaving these struts there. So you can see the endothelium touched uh, and these uh, patches. And the basic um, problem of a neoatherosclesion is the rupture of a plaque. You have two plaques which have ruptured, and this is an ACS in a neoatherosclerotic uh, segment. So, OCT is probably one of the best suited tools to detect the of, uh, stent failure. So, I have been asked uh, twice during these sessions as to use OCT. So, if I get, get a case of stent failure, OCT will, which I totally rely on, and it tells me the etiology of stent failure. Um, I, I think it is unmatched in this segment uh, for uh, understanding of the reasons of the stent. Uh, now this is a borrowed slide which kind of shows that the import proper stent expansion and if you find your stent you can um, uh, leave this patient uh, to either develop stent thrombosis I told you it can occur at any stage to develop um, ISR. So I, I, all these uh, will lead to other adverse cardiac generally linked to target uh, vessel. This probably is from the uh, consensus document European Association or PCI. So basically it underlines the fact if you are putting a stent, please expand it well. Please the criteria if you're using imaging, use all the criteria which this uh, document mentions. At least have 80% expansion, whichever model you are tapered, your dual method. So you must ensure that you're still uh, expanded. Then before I conclude this session, this is a slight lab which clearly pointed out uh, that um, in terms of OCT in day-to-day um, uh, -day PCIs and um, basically transform decision in close to 90% of uh, lesions. Such is the um, importance of imaging that uh, whether you look at the morphology, the size of the stent, which you set the diameter of the stent, you selected based on angiography, all this undergoes uh, uh, transform in a pre-PCI run. So I mentioned this yesterday also that uh, if uh, I have to select between Images pre or post. I, I don't think you should get into a situation to select, but PPCI image is very, very important. Really orient you to the uh, vessel morphology as to what is happening within the vessel and what you need to uh, time. And um, post CI optimization definitely it helps it help dissections, it helps you find uh, out whether you oppose the stent well, and uh, most importantly, the expansion. The implanted stent is very, very important. Thank you for your patient hearing and open this talk for. Uh, before you go on to session two. Are there any questions? Uh, I'll welcome them. Hi, sir. This is again Sunil Vani. Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Tell me, Sunil. Uh, sir, osteal, yes, yes. Uh, uh, osteal lesions with calcification might okay. be circumferential or nodular. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, OCT, as we say, the ostium can sometimes be a challenge. So, if you have only the left wing or the RCA, okay. ostium only of left wing. Circumflex and uh, LAD and circumflex is not an issue at all with OCT. It's the left main and the RCA ostium which is an issue. Right, and and uh, so so this is the pre PCI, and obviously the post. What's if you have placed the stent, then uh, uh, the imaging is uh, equally good. But the ostium, when if you have an ostial uh, left main, so um, there is a little learning curve where the ostial left main OCT is concerned, you know, because the blood clearance is an issue, and uh, you will of course not generate uh, very good uh, images with OCT of the left main ostium. And um, uh, the other problem with the OCT is that um, uh, you cannot assess the plaque burden. 
So for the left main ostium and for the RCA ostium, um, operators use um, guideliners, gui these um, mother, mother and child. So these catheters are used so that now you have um, contrast coming uh, from the guidezilla, which clears the uh, uh, vessel lumen and the heading catheter, which is now slightly outside or uh, jet coming from that clears the uh, contrast uh, at the level of the ostium. So this needs a little bit of uh, practice. Having said that, if you have facilities uh, doing IVAS for the ostium of the left main or the, I would strongly advocate to use IVAS for these two lesion subsets. Whereas the ostium of LAD and circumflex is concerned, OCT is unmatched compared to IVAS. It will give you a plethora of information because you need to know not disease, whether it's confined only to the LAD or the circumflex into the distal left main. It will also give you the bifurcation angle. It will give you a lot of information about the carinal uh, tip. And we also use what is called BPC, the bifurcation point and carinal tip distance. So all this you'll be able to get on your uh, the bifurcation mode, which is an advantage with OCT because you have a 3D reconstruct, which is uh, possible. So uh, the ostium of left main and RCA, I, I feel that I was, but the, at the other sides, I think OCT is unmatched. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> The other question is regarding uh, uh, calcification. When you have a calcification, uh, calcification where you, you feel that you cannot enter with the OCT method and you have to prep it with a rotor ablation. So that would little alter the anatomy though, but but still, uh, I guess, uh, how do you, how do you, how would you guide us uh, in this particular area? You know, uh, Sunil, it's very, very important. Um, uh, to make passage the OCT catheter to get in to get optimal images. I have uh, got into a situation with the calcium where I've used a CTO wire, a Nick Nano balloon to get the rota wire in, rota wire also. And uh, thereafter, uh, with about 50 of burying time, I could get the birth through starting from uh, upsizing 0.25 to 1.5 and then acquiring images. Uh, but image acquisition is equally important here really, to characterize the calcium you know, in terms of thickness and in terms of its um, distribution, whether it's pure nodular, circumferential, segment, because all this has a bearing. And um, I will, in addition, mention uh, once you've done that, you need to crack the calcium, whether you use a um, pressure balloon or you use IVL. I have uh, some phenomenal cases with IVL because the important thing is that OCT is one tool which will tell you how to grade or how to um, strategize in terms of where where you need to spend more energy. You know, wherever I mean any calcific lesion which is which basically um, has presented for intervention to you, you need to know the lesion so that you spend more there. The vessel will be diffusely calcified. But I would select points based on OCT. Notice the thick plate here. The so calcium is more than a millimeter here. Thickness of calcium is little less here. The calcium is more circumference area. So I will be spending more energy. I will be using more hardware there because as you all having, um, you all are senior operators, that angiogram, you cannot differentiate between, uh, I mean, the adventitial and the intimal calcium. So it becomes very difficult. The vessel appears diffusely calcium. I have a tram track appearance. But yes, the calcium is deep. You really don't know what is the thickness of calcium. So OCT is a phenomenal tool that in the entire course of vessel, in the proximal or distal or the mid part is the chunk of calcium which is located and where you need to kind of uh, use the for uh, ethereum. Thank you much. So that is the importance of OCT. So can I ask a question here? Ah, uh, please. So in case you don't have an OCT, are there any angiographic or fluoroscopic parameters to assess whether we are dealing with adventitial calcium or intimal calcium? Are there some ways? At times, you may not have the luxury. Absolutely not. See, acute, acute, acute situation. Uh, Maybe you don't have the luxury. And now, nowadays, we get chip cases even in acute situations at times. You get calcified lesions and elderly no, patients. Absolutely. Uh, Samir, so are there any unfortunate. Unfortunately, not Samir, because what happens is it's kind of two dimensional and you you can. There are a lot of people who get CT scans done to look at the calcium score or the calcium distribution. But uh, calcium is a big deterrent, you know, whether it's in adventimal, the you even on CT scan, you'll see everything appears white. You the luminogram wherever the calcium is located. So this is calcium is a, a deterrent for uh, an optimal CT assessment also. Same holds true for angio. You cannot, it's a two dimensional. It's and angiogram is a, it's a kind of luminogram. So you really, it doesn't tell you as to where the calcium is located. I think the same holds true even with uh, IVAS. If I put in an IVAS uh, catheter, I would really not know, get to know where, where is the calcium located and as to what is the thickness of uh, calcium. So it just gets reflected from the surface. So uh, 
Uh, very, very difficult. The only thing is that you have all your gadgets in place. If you don't have the luxury of uh, doing an imaging, then you have uh, all the appliances with you, you know, rotablation and then high pressure balloons. So they, they have to be on your side. And most importantly, um, you must always choose a seven French guider. And I always advocate when you're doing a calcified lesion, you need good guide support. So see as to uh, where good guide support from the radial or from the femoral. So select the site accordingly. And you need to have the guidezillas or the guide supporting or guide extensions with you. Because without them doing a calcified, again, a big uh, problem. Because tracking of your balloons, everything is going to be a problem. Need to identify branches which will, uh, you know, in case guide support, uh, the branches which are which will allow or permit some amount of anchoring in case there are situations even despite using guide hardware is not tracking. So I, I mean large guides is the and you have to be very, very careful with your left main or see if there is calcium coming extending into the left main because your guiding catheter in the left main can also damage your left main. So be very watchful of the, uh, these things. So thank you. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Please, so how do you please. how do you how will you assess the uh, coronary diameter? particularly when there is a positive remodeling of the heart. So whether you will still consider IEL to IEL or you will contain, you will consider luminogram lumen diameters so, or it doesn't make any difference. Sir. So uh, actually um, a good question. So uh, you, if wherever you can identify EL, you should use that. If you are not able to identify, say in a calcified vessel, in a vessel where there is a lot of plaque burden, you have to use the lumen diameter and upsize. Now talking about uh, intervening segment where there has been disease related or atherosclerotic or atherosclerosis there is positive remodeling or there is a mild ectasia which has happened in those situations you it's very important that you size in such a manner that i have a distal vessel which is 2.5 and in the intermediate the vessel suddenly becomes uh, you know four millimeters and proximal is around uh, three three point five correct so in such cases mild ectasia where there is positive remodeling and the vessel is suddenly expanded i always split my stents I cannot use one stent which will match both the distal and the proximal diameter and I split my stents in such that the in the intervening segment where there is the vessel has grown to around four millimeters or so I size which is expandable to four millimeter so I'll do a focal dilatation at the segment so that I achieve some amount of position uh, there rather than uh, leave the stent hanging so you, your stent sizing has to be not only based on your uh, uh, distal references the the uh, splitting of the stents to sub sizes in terms of length should be dictated by the uh, expansion of these stents selected. Okay. One small question. So, uh, shifting focus into acute coronary Please. syndromes. You have uh, acute coronary syndrome right. and you have treated him typically, maybe an MSTEMI. And uh, with that, you go ahead and do an OCT. Now, you are Let's assume you're doing it here to check for plaque erosion or you. plaque rupture. Can you hear Amazed me, sir, now? You are off. Not audible, sir? Not audible. Yeah, speak on. Can I? Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you now. Speak, please. Yeah. I can hear you. Clearly. So, to check for plaque erosions and plaque ruptures, suppose you're doing an OCT in an acute coronary syndrome, and you see only thrombus when you go in and do the OCT. So, yeah, uh, is it possible because of the uh, depth which uh, it cannot uh, uh, penetrate, the penetration poor is with OCT, how do you go and measure the, or check for the uh, vessel walls so I, I think in the presence of significant Samir, thrombus. I had a similar question yesterday and my answer is very simple. I don't waste energy in thrombotic lesions by doing OCT. I, I don't do OCT for thrombus filled vessels. There is absolutely no joy and uh, it can be detrimental. So if I have a vessel which is complete with thrombus, no additional information can be obtained by using either OCT. Imaging has a very limited role. You can do OCT only if that's what I had mentioned. If I have, see window period in ACS is very, very important. You know, any, within first six hours, you still have hope. Anyone coming and just collateralized from the other side, elderly male who comes by even six to eight hours, but he's developed collateral. It's a obstruction which has developed and now suddenly there's a plaque erosion and there is, and the vessel is thrombus filled. Put a wire inside. Since the distal vessel is collateralized from the other side, the flow is microvasculature is fine and the thrombus load is not going to be significant. But if a young uh, male or a female smoker who presents anyone between 25 years of age group, and those who have some other associated risk factors which predispose them. These patients come with large burden. These patients come with very severe solic uh, dysfunction. And these patients generally present late are hemodynamically unstable. So you should not waste too much of energy in them. One or two shoots, if it's a thrombus filled vessel, can give some intracoronary retakes, you put them on triple therapy, get them back at the end of 
three, four weeks, see phenomenal resolution and then the story will be, uh, you know, complete for you. That stage you can do OCT to find out whether it was plaque erosion, ruptured plaque or what had happened. 90% of these patients who present with sudden occlusion and uh, this thing will have some uh, thing to uh, guide your first mint. And invariably, if the vessel is completely open and is recanalized, you would not require to stent. Yet. I never stent. Even if I see a ruptured plaque, if the ML is more than 4.55, I leave it alone because this will heal over. The natural history studies are very clearly shown that these plaques heal over. The heal. problem I face is when young or middle aged people who come to us after, say, thrombolysis, say the next day after thrombolysis, you're doing an angiogram, that is when you have a reasonably open artery, but there is a significant lesion. When you go and do the OCT, it's filled with thrombus, so you're not any wiser to know whether it's the character of the plaque. Yeah, I, I can understand. If, if at that stage you find that. Um, and the thrombin is considerable, stenting should be avoided because you majority of the time this lesion is secondary to stenting. If you balloon, nothing will happen. Balloon causes very little dislodgement of thrombus. The only risk with the balloon is if you have a proximal LAD thrombus, if you balloon, you have to be really careful sucking or pulling this balloon out. Especially if you're using an NC balloon, they get wing, you'll be sucking thrombus back in, which will now get pushed into circumflex. So the only advice is in a thrombus filled vessel uh, in the proximal of LAD, you must inject while bringing the balloon out into the left main segment. These are small tips. We've all, you know, had our own shape application. So uh, it, it um, one learns playing down. So I am telling you from my personal experiences. Thank you. So can I ask? Yeah, please. Uh, so I just wanted to know you decides the calcium depth, whether it will be intimal or deep. And is there any predisposition according to vessels uh, that there will be a deep calcium in this vessel and superficial calcium in this vessel? Or is there any uh, any of these two calciums commoner than the other? So which calcium is commoner uh, according to you? Kalyan, very difficult to predict. This is all, uh, you know, linked to the genetic milieu of a given individual. So whether the... Um, whether the individual is going to have calcific coronary artery disease or not. So there are certain genes in the body which express the uh, uh, NC towards calcification. I would not like to go into details of that. The um, distribution of calcium, as I told you, uh, there are some more studies which have shown you. It all starts with calcific specks which come from calcific sheets. And it is these sheets which grow over a period of time. So these sheets, when they collase, they can um, share the into the lumen and this is what leads to formation of an calcific nodule. So this um, irregular calcific nodule is multiple calcific sheets with uh, some amount of thrombotic material. So there are a lot of people that I have treated a calcific nodule. They have in fact treated a, a nodule which is an irregular or a uh, uh, nodule which has got an intermixture as well as thrombus. The other subset is calcific protrusion. Protrusion is these sheets collase and they stay in the media and then they jut out and they will have an intact and lining on top. So these calcific protrusive nodules are slightly more difficult to and uh, these generally require orbital atherectomy for treatment which is one tool which is not available in the country but in a very simple manner we don't have as of now any we don't have finding out the extent and distribution of a given individual and uh, as to who will who will not develop is dictated by the genetic milieu. Thank you. Can I ask a question sir? Uh, please, please sir. So, uh, now just speaking of the uh, nodules uh, can you uh, sometimes uh, confuse on the OCT uh, uh, a low attenuated uh, calcific nodule with uh, a deep calcium to uh, uh, it's a luminal thing the white thrombus but uh, can sometimes it is process trying to ask because so, you mentioned uh, lumen versus yeah, uh, yeah, correct. Well, so, um, the uh, calcific nodule is invariably confused with red thrombus not white thrombus white thrombus you can get all around and it's a filling defect which should be a white discrete thing within the lumen now what happens in the nodule is that it juts into the surface so the there will be a scatter over the surface the surface will appear white beyond that since you will not be able to go or you will see a kind of filling defect there so it appears like a red thrombus Sometimes it becomes difficult to differentiate a calcium from the red thrombus now the differentiating features are that anyone having a significant calcific nodule will have some evidence of calcification angiographically. So you will see some calcium angiographically. Number two, if you've done OCT, see that there will be considerable calcification throughout the course of SL. I mean, calcific nodule cannot come focally at one point and the remaining vessel of uh, calcium. No, it cannot happen. That means a big nodule has formed only from the multiple sheets coming together. So there have to be calcific sheets elsewhere in the same vessel. So if you do OCT, you'll see that there is a lot of calcium, both proximal and distal to the nodule. 
So this, this basically tells you that what you're dealing with is a calcific nodule and not red. So the differential diagnosis of a calcific nodule is a red what? thrombus because you can see uh, nothing. One more here. question. Uh, with the ISR, the NIH and NIA, so, so it's always mixed. It's not like you would always only get a pure, you would, but uh, most of the time it's like a mixed kind of a situation. So uh, would want to understand from you, uh, the management wise, uh, uh, you decide from the OCT that you're doing mm -hmm. this, like say if you have, uh, obviously NIH, you would want to use a cutting balloon versus, uh, uh, how would OCT, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, how, how number would you one, OCT? Num uh, I understand what you're trying to ask. Number one point is that whenever I have an intermill hyperplasia, I would like to first see whether it's physiological, that means it's just covering the struts, or pathological. So any pathological intermill hyperplasia will have thickness more than 600 microns, point number one. So now know that it is pathological. Now, if there is an intermill hyperplasia present, I would now like to see telltale evidence of neoatherosclerosis in this uh, hyperplastic segment. So what you see is what you normally see in a vessel. This hyperplastic segment will show you, as I showed you, some lipid deposit. These will be islands of absolute uh, um, dark areas which are there. And you can also take of calcium which are coming on top. Then has been seen is that these will collapse and come to a surface. So if you have lipid pools located which are large enough and are located very close to an hyperplastic segment, then it means and the MLA of the vessel is small. Always, you know, very strongly advocated physiology guided PCI. So even though I have cell which has been stented previously and has gotten hyperplastin, and this segment is also showing some amount of neoatherosclerosis, still not treated till the time I find this physiologically significant. So I would rather do an FFR, RFR and see and then uh, put my energy for treatment. Let's get into a situation where I have a neoatherosclerotic segment it's physiologically significant. Correct? Now, I have the options of using cutting balloons, I mean scoring or a cutting balloon, followed by drug eluting balloon or a stent. Now, guides me into this is a simple fact, the extent and distribution of the neoatherosclerosis. If diffuse and if the etiology is under expansion of the previously expand, previous expanded uh, stent, then I would cut, use NC, use high pressure balloons and expand the previously implanted stent to the utmost extent and if it is then i use just a drug eluting balloon and come out irrespective of the fact whether you're going to use a deb or a desk you need to really expand it hard you need you have to go all guns blazing after the cutting balloon use nc balloon and then use the uh, balloon op and nc and just expand it well otherwise i have seen people sandwiching they just dilate with the nc and put another stent and you create a sandwich you know one struck layer intimal hyperplasia in between and another stent layer. And I can I can give it on a stamp paper that these patients will come back within six months with restenosis of the freshly implanted stent. Now, as for the recent uh, guidelines which come in 2019, if you already implanted two stents, people are very fond of changing. Oh, earlier he got ever everolimus, this time I'll get serolimus. No, that is absurd. Change of the brand or the drug is not going to change the outcome. What is going to change the outcome is the bed preparation. You know, so now as per the recent consensus document, if you have two stents in place, you are third stent is absolutely contraindicated. You have to rely only on cutting balloons and depth because you can load this patient with additional uh, metal uh, strut and you send this patient for a bypass surgery. So, so just to uh, extend the question, say if you have two layers of uh, stent, then uh, I think we do not have uh, much armamentarium on. But but you would still understand the mechanism. I, I, I use a lot of depth with very good results, and you have to use them after optimal bread preparation. And you will see to believe the vessel starts growing, and the result. I am telling you, everything is linked to expansion. How well you've expanded. You have to try this. Uh, you have sir, to, if if, uh, if you have two layers of stent, sir, and if surgery is contraindicated, can you not uh, contemplate whether this patient may require excimer laser? to break that intimal oh, hyperplasia in between the two stents. I mean, you're absolutely right, Dr. Shah. Whatever it takes to kind of expand, please go ahead. Very, very nice point you brought out. If I have a very thick hyperplastic segment, I have laser and, uh, you know, kind of uh, treatment and then uh, uh, decide need to do. I, I tell you the most important thing is the bed the uh, expansion of the uh, bed, which is very, very so One more extension of the same question. Yeah, if please. the ISR comes very yeah, late, please. sir, suppose after one year, two okay. years, 
so when you see okay, very late new age hyperplasia <laughs> maybe maybe after 2 3 years you know yeah, yeah, and there yeah. is and a new atherosclerosis on it new right. atherosclerosis on it then what will be your modality of treatment whether you will do only drug eluting balloon or this patient will require so I, I, I think i think i answered the same thing and i told you that um, if i have new atherosclerosis which is happening and i see which is a very common thing to notice uh, you know what what happens uh, we are kind of digressing from the main issue with the drug eluting stent the hyperplasia is heterogeneous it will be thick in one point thin point it can be eccentric you will have calcification or lipid deposits everything happening same in different uh, points so if i put a small stent and it shows but if i put a 48 mm stent and that entire thing is for neoatherosclerosis and this that then i'll have doubts about uh, putting stent in that but if i put a small focal stent so then i can uh, cut i can expand and put in a layer of metal hoping that this time on i have expanded the bed and i have done a good job so i i mean you know uh, what i told yesterday also in uh, medical science we all know that one is never true so one cannot um, have fixed answers to um, the questions you i, I mean um, each situation will warrant um, uh, thoughtful assessment and uh, kind of uh, a solution which uh, will uh, give you good at the end of six not only six months but at the end of six years so that's very very important thank you <clears throat> shall we go on to the case cases we'll keep having uh, these discussions um, any more questions i can I'm, i'm more than happy to answer Uh, sir, I want to ask uh, if any in concerning an effect, is there any role for sizing of vessels sir, in the OCT? Uh, Vivek, um, you know, uh, if you have a concertina, your image quality is going to be poor. Your uh, everything is going to be a problem. A vessel which is got constricted, which is tortuous, you put in on this thing. So your um, assessment is going to be uh, fallacious. So this is a very difficult uh, situation. Very difficult situations. You. Um, uh probably i think uh, maybe ivas will score over oc situation because it will at least uh, media but even that will be fallacious because there is constriction so where there is vaso constriction and of two sizes is going to be very very difficult so in uh, rcs sir when it is arteries in spasm so every time uh, taking el to el size every time we should give ntg and tech sizing sir Because it is very strongly to, why, why, see in the sense you you spasm can occur in any of the coronary segments it can occur even in the left main or in the lad but yes you very correctly pointed out it's more common in the rca so whenever you you do uh, you want an optimal uh, oct assessment hemodynamics permitting you should use um, again uh, take the runs uh, sir one more question uh, sir uh, occasionally yeah. anytime we see two three sirs are uh, mal opposed maybe less than 3 uh, mm in uh, segment sir should we chase or should we leave all these segments no no sir, i didn't get what you said you okay. sir uh, uh, many no. times after oct we see now uh, few studs are there which are mal opposed may not be a position indicator okay. showing uh, see I, i i told i told very clearly you know mal opposition needs to be chased if the uh, longitudinal extent is more than 3 mm or the distance between the struct and the vessel wall is more than 300 uh, yes. microns so under these circumstances you need to chase if the longitudinal extent is less than 3 and the distance between the struct and the vessel wall is uh, less than 300 micron you alone sir, you but, can leave uh, it maybe the that uh, more than 300 micron it is there but uh, length is less sir so we see many times 2 3 sir we should not chase you, yeah yeah no no don't don't need to chase it you don't need to chase it okay thank you sir all right so we'll see some um, cases uh, now um right so they are essentially going to be based on this algorithm which is the uh, mld uh, max so we'll have um, uh, four cases one of uh, of a fibrotic lesion a recanalized artery um, uh, calcium uh, i'm not showing you a calcium which i would have really liked to which i had very little uh, preparation uh, time and, um, um, left main uh, bifurcation provisional uh, stenting so let's go on to the first case which is uh, a fibrotic this was in a Uh, middle-aged male who was in hypertension with unstable angina had a non-dominant LCX showed uh, a discrete uh, kind of lesion. So we same algorithm for the uh, assessment of this going by the MLD. We looked at the morphology. So this is the uh, uh, run uh, it was uh, taken. So we are coming from distal to the proximal complex. We went to the plaque segment, and you can see here there is a buildup of fatty plaque, and there is a little intimal dissection which just went by. It is part of the lesion which we just crossed, and now we are approaching the proximal uh, part of the uh, lesion which appears to be healthy. 
and uh, we are entering the left main uh, now. Uh, what we've uh, done is we've acquired the OCT. Now this is the longitudinal profile, uh, and this clearly shows you the the areas are telling you the dimension of the proximal and distal reference, and the the mineral area has been marked as. So this is the point where the MLA is the smallest, and the area is about 1.17. The distal uh, reference which is 6.3, and the proximal which is about 7.07. <clears throat> the areas now this is going to be the distal reference where we can uh, uh, and as we move proximally we'll see build up of a fibrous plaque a fibro fatty plaque these are the lipid deposits as you can see the dark areas and uh, this is the area which has more lipid uh, uh, deposits and we come to mill part and we mark the proximal reference and in this area we can see a small ruptured uh, plaque also there are a few macrophages which have been picked up and uh, this is the proximal uh, reference which shows three layers now when we mark these proximal and distal uh, references they help us uh, you know find out as to what will be the length and i mentioned that el is very important you should be able to see about 180 degrees of el and this segment has to be having less than 50 percent so if you've been able to identify use el if you've not been able to identify then use the lumen uh, dimension so after having marked the uh, proximal and uh, marked the distal reference we get what in length now this is about 18 millimeters we do get a stent which is 18 millimeters so we select a stent size of 18 millimeters now we while marking the, the proximal uh, reference um, here what you can see is that we've used el in this case so then we'll select the point of now kind of identified that this is the point at which we are able to see the structure we go on to the left uh, right corner select lens from el to el we have to take two cross sectional uh, so second cross-sectional uh, cut being taken and now you have these two dimensions so we've already got the dimension and we do the same thing for the similar uh, segment but in situations not able to get <clears throat> the el like in this case example you will have to use the lumen diameter and when you use the lumen diameter you have to when you use el you have to downsize having said as in this case when we measured the proximal diameter came to around 55 so we round it down to 3.5 millimeters so these were um, el measurements now these are lumen based measurements has taken which are considerably smaller so these are e measurements which you have taken so you round it you get a mean of ff so you round it down to 3.5 this is an el based uh, now the proximal segment similarly we measured three uh, one we could not take the cross section because there was a large buildup of a lipid block here only one dimension and since the vessel was circular we were happy with one dimension so we got better so we rounded down to three millimeters now we as you know we like the stent size based on the distal diameter so we chose a 318 uh, stent and uh, this stent was subsequently implanted with uh, good results and the proximal segment was post dilated with uh, five so this was the first run post stent implantation you can see a lot of swirls that means was not very good at the time of injection so you have to be careful so the 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 acquired uh, our the consistency of the uh, injection was not very good as you come towards the proximal segment again the vessel appears uh, well expanded so we check for dissection so there is no edge dissection we look for a position the position indicator everything is right that means the stent is very well opposed the opposed stent need not be well expanded so there are two different things well up well a position and expansion these are two different things so this is a very well uh, post stent because the line is absolutely uh, white so white indicate stent position is fine and here we had used 400 mic micron as the criteria so it is less than 400 micron so it's a well opposed uh, stent we don't need to do anything more but let's check the expansion when we check on the expansion then on the tapered reference we've used tapered because there's there are no significant branches which are on a tapered reference this appears there appears to be considerable expansion which compared to the proximal reference it's only eight percent expanded here and whereas the limit for around 80 percent so we need to go back so the machine is going to mark this in the lumen profile and if the under expansion is considerable this so the red layer will be much more so now we head and uh, we use the dual method just for the sake of training where the vessel now be divided into two halves the proximal half and the distal are using those standards there was considerable under expansion uh, here so one needs to the stent was post dilated on post dilatation in both the dual as well as in the taper this cell expanded and appears to be 80 percent now what you see at a chair is probably linked to the blood swirls and the blood swirls are the ones which are red thing we'll show you some more case examples as we um, but the cell scent is well expanded so we've got no dissection we have a well opposed, which is well expanded it's 88 percent and uh, by the tapered method and 91 percent by the uh, dual method dual method basically implies you've divided the stent into proximal and distal half using the uh, a references so this is the final picture which we get of a well expanded uh, stent now let's look at the second case which is that of a 
post ACS was uh, type 3 LAD, which had uh, pregnant disease, L6 and RCA were normal. So FFR was done for this case and it went uh, 7 6. So the lesion was significant. Even though if you see angiographically, there's a little doubt. Um, close to the D2 origin, there appears to be uh, a disease, but they appear intermediate. So we had to resort to doing coronary physiology, which showed the lesion to be significant. So we went ahead and did the OCT. And upon um, this is the LAD, uh, it is still. Uh, to proximal. Now you can see a reek is thrombus. It's kind of a honey, honeycombing of the uh, vessel. Multiple septae. These are nothing but the fibrin strands which have been left behind an organized thrombus where the RBCs have dissolved. The proximal segment uh, is to have a little bit of, bit of plaque but not so significantly diseased. Now this, what tell you, was done with angioco registration. We'll see as to how it helps us. So we're trying to identify the proximal and, uh, and distal uh, references. So this is a healthy zone. This is where the uh, thrombus burden uh, begin to show up and there is some amount of recanalization of this thrombus. This gives you a, a recomb uh, appearance or a lotus stem appearance also people call it. These are chunk uh, septae which are there. So uh, if it is very diffuse, then you need to get on to the true loop, the wire and catheter. And I have had some occasions where I have had to in long standing uh, uh, recanalize vessels. One has a balloon for the catheter to get in. So this is how it appears. You can see uh, multiple uh, septate and we are coming to the proximal septate as normal. So this is what is, and this is how the angioco registration helps. You have the proximal and the distal segment. You have lesion length here is 26 millimeters. So we don't get a stent of 26. So we've selected eight millimeter stent to address this uh, vessel. We've identified the diameter. So you can screw the normal uh, segment. And once you come to the normal segment, you are able to see nearly 180 degree EL. So the stent diameter, the distal here is around three millimeters. And when we scroll to the prox reference segment, the diameter here is about 3.5 millimeters. The lesion length 26, we've selected as a 28. So we've selected a 328, uh, that's around uh, 3.5. So we'll be post dilating this after deployment with a 3.5 millimeter NC balloon. And this is one which is taken post uh, PCI. If you can see this, there was absolutely no dissection. Now, a few red markings which you can uh, see that automatically marks the cell not expanded well. And I told you these red dots basically indicate uh, branches. In the cross sectional view, the stent struct appear to be closed, uh, except for the proximal part where we are approaching. It appears ruts are also red. So you will see in the cross sectional image, there are um, the, uh, the strands are not well opposed. Now, why is this has happened? Probably because we are the stent has encroached the segment. There are side branches, or in this case, we've uh, come onto the segment where there is either a dash or the circumflex origin. This is the left main segment. So that is how it gets marked red. And the opposition shows that at this point, I will stop it here and I'll show you. At this point, oh, oh it's gone to the previous slide. Sorry. Let me get it here and I'll show you. So a little bit more. So now you see there is some amount of malaposition which is there. It's probably linked to the side branch origin. Um, we look for dissections. There were no edge dissections at the either of the ends. There was some amount of uh, malaposition which was noted. So this was probably one or two struts which were uh, coming against the origin of the circumflex. So angiocore uh, registration showing that. But most majority of the stent was well opposed. We also uh, measured the since this was less than about three millimeters and the white probably indicates that it is well opposed. We looked for um, chin now and um, the expansion appeared fine except for one focal segment where it has picked up as around 85% uh, expansion. But in majority, the machine will automatically, if you take the cuts, it will automatically areas and it will show you the expansion kinetics. If you've seen 88, 90, this is done uh, post uh, this thing. At times, the blood swirls give you all uh, impressions, some amount of malaposition. We also looked at the branches. There was a diagonal which was uh, coming out and uh, the early showcase mode that there are not too many struts across this uh, diagonal, which is very optimally. And this is a fly through view. A lot of operators are fond of this view, which kind of, if it all appears white, that means very much the point is not, it will appear uh, red in color. So you wouldn't have to where the stent is opposed or not. Now I'm very fond of rendered stent view. These are, these are the rendered uh, stent view again from the uh, uh, 3D bifurcation mode. And this you will, um, 3D navigation will get the stent uh, struts only. You can have, you can remove the guide wires. The guide wire has not been removed. Here, the vessel wall is also there. But all the side branches will have a pink marking. And when you rotate these images, you'll see whether there are struts across these uh, branches or not. 
so we have no uh, dissection. The stent is very well opposed. And if you see the expansion on the taper method, it appears to be 85% and the dual method 98%. So well um, expanded stent. We need not do anything. And this was the uh, uh, shoot of the vessel. To the third case, which had uh, both calcium and fibrosis. So um, this was, again, a young patient who had... Um, presented with uh, chronic uh, stable angina, went ahead and did the OCT. Now, this was the OCT run in this patient. Again, um, a run in the, um, it, it showed um, uh, variable thickness of fibrosis and uh, calcosis. It's not one of those intensely calcified or, uh, uh, which was quite amenable to simple angioplasty tools of using uh, NC balloons. Come. So, you can see now we are approaching the lesion and there is uh, deep calcium. These are the calcific bye bye, that is coming going. up. There, this is the proximal uh, segment of the LAD and a branch coming out. So now if you see, um, we identify the proximal uh, and the distal. This is the guider. We, we are trying to identify the segments. This was the distal reference. You can see a thick fibrous block build up along with a calcific nodule at 12 o'clock position. And in this view, you can uh, see apart from the guide wire, it appears to be a small tear, which is there. The big plate, which is extending from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock position, along with some amount of fibrosis. And some calcific deposits, deep catch in the uh, proximal part of the vessel. And near the 50, we mark the proximal, which appears to be uh, pretty good for landing the uh, stent. So uh, based on our OCT um, Images we did the proximal and distal referencing. The proximal, the distal data came as 2.5, and the uh, proximal reference diameter came to around 3.5. So there was a, a lot of taper in, the, in this vessel, and the lesion length was around 50 uh, millimeters. When you get a lesion like this, which is pretty long, and it dictates that you use two stents, um, even if it were say 20 mm, 25 millimeter, distal diameter was 2.5 and the proximal was 3.5, I would have used two stents because I cannot dilate a 2.5 stent to 3.5 millimeter. So the size matrix not uh, allow this. So as was um, uh, the lesion length here was uh, long. So we kind of sent stents uh, 2.5, uh, 48 and 3.5, 8 so that we were should be able to post dilate. Um, so the proximal EL was here coming to around 4 millimeter. that 3.5 can be dilated to 4 millimeters comfortably. Now post-implant, um, since the stent had uh, come a little bit in the segment, there was, as you can see, there is some amount of malloposition uh, in there. And the indicator also tells that there is uh, uh, some amount of under-expansion. So there were no dissections noted. Now we come to the opposition indicator, which kind of shows you that the left main part, the stent is... Uh, probably under it, but not well opposed. These are the red dots. These arrows kind of indicate that these is not well opposed here. And you get it in the profile. This uh, tells you that the stent is not. So we needed to get uh, further. So there was under expansion here also. So when we measure roughly, we get around 4.4. So we needed a slightly larger balloon. But this was the measurement which is uh, done from block to uh, block. So we then went ahead and put it. Since this patient had a little bit of ACS, you can see there is a lot of protrusion with the stunt struts, which we thought was kind of white thrombus, which has uh, been, um, which has come through the stunt struts into the uh, vessel wall. Many a times while you're doing these calcific uh, patients, use a lot of dissection while uh, dilating. And if your heparin uh, is suboptimal, you'll get to see a lot of this because platelets will uh, uh, cling on to those ruptured uh, endothelium <clears throat> very, very fast. And this has been, uh, you know, you've not uh, checked the ACT screen because the procedure kind of becomes uh, very long. Uh, it becomes uh, uh, very difficult track because your all your energies are diverted towards pushing the hardware into the uh, into the vessel. So there's a lot of white thrombus. There is microthrombi over the catheter also, as I was telling you. So patient um, underwent high pressure post dilatation and they did the OCT. And if you see the cross-sectional image, it's, it's absolutely studded with the white thrombi. So these are at times a uh, little scary. And despite well it stent, you'll get these red markings. These are probably because the, the stent appears to be under expanded because it is fully covered thrombi. Now the proximal part, which is to the uh, left main portion is now well expanded and the apposition indicator tells you that the stent is well opposed. But if you see the longitudinal view where the cursor is now approaching, moment it close to 12 or 13, where my pointer is now, you will see the cross-section absolutely studded. So not only the cross-section image, also you can see there are a lot of white thrombus which is there. And so this patient uh, was um, 
shown to, I mean, this patient had a lot of uh, uh, white thrombus in this. So we probably gave a GP2B3 inhibitor and then took a run again. There was considerable uh, pollution of this uh, white thrombus. So you need to resort to these things and you need to wait on table to see so maybe the antiplatelets were not working well in this. Uh, given each case offers a different set of challenges and you need to think and uh, think and provide uh, then in there. So now we have a well expanded uh, tent and uh, without uh, much under expansion, almost all the uh, so the expansion more than uh, 80 uh, percent. So this is how it appears and this is by using the dual uh, uh, method. You present in two halves in the proximal and the distal half and you have the MSAs and the expansion pretty good. There are no white thrombi or the platelet plugs which are sticking onto the uh, surface. So no medial dissections, well opposed tent and by the tapered uh, method, we see the expansion was around uh, 82 uh, percent. The end, uh, we had a very uh, good result. So this brings uh, me to the sorry, last sorry, case, sorry, which sorry. is so in case this of, case, uh, uh, did you bring this tent back to the left main? Uh, I mean, was the second yes, tent? Into yes, the yes okay. into the left main. It came into the left main. So left main was disease so to begin with or? No, no. I will discuss this. Let me finish this. Okay, we can sorry, discuss. Sorry, this. Sorry, sorry, we sorry. can discuss this. This this was a post op uh, CABG um, case which um, um, had very tight distal left main nurses. So we dilated the. Uh, then so it becomes mandatory uh, because your OCT catheter. Will end. So in these situations, you use a two millimeter balloon. You dilate with the two millimeter balloon. This allows the OCT catheter to get in, and now you can see uh, a venous grapnel is flowing well now because you've dilated and the contrast is all through this. So uh, what we've done, we've applied the MLD here. So let's apology of this. We did under Andrew for registration. So this basically, this was a run which back from LAD into the left main. So it showed laden block with mild calcium. And there were also um, section at the site of the tight. Uh, and we also studied the bifurcation uh, anatomy. So what you see is the reference which we got. We see a calcium node segment. We also see some calcific uh, plate. This was uh, osteal LED with uh, dissections. This balloon induced dissection because it was a very tight lesion uh, here and the uh, proximal left main uh, segment, which also some amount of uh, plaque uh, burden. So this is how you assess the uh, bifurcation uh, anatomy on a long view. There is the carina not protruding. So we are reasonably sure that if you stand circumflex, since there is no carinal uh, protrusion, there won't be any carina into the left main uh, ostium. We also measured the carinal tip angle, which was around 60 degrees. Anything less than 60 degrees is pretty safe. Planning, which, yeah? What I have not, there is the bifurcation, bifurcation point and the carinal tip distance, which should be less than one if it is less than 1.7 uh, the chances of sh shifting of the side branch is very high if it is more than 1.7 you are pretty safe to stent across this uh, side branch usual did the proximal and distal reference the distal reference was four proximal was 4.5 lesion length was around uh, three millimeters so we chose a uh, 43 stent and we had decided to proximally post dilate with a four point meter so we went ahead and um, did the OCT uh, stenting. The uh, the run was taken from distal LED to the left main. This, and this uh, longitudinal view appears to be very well expanded. There were no edge dissections which were uh, noted. The opposition was just fine. You don't see any uh, malapo uh, stent struts because um, uh, the distal edge, absolutely fine edge, absolutely fine. And the, um, the opposition indicator showing you that everything is, it's all white, so you don't need to worry. We went ahead and we decided in this case, we are going to go through the uh, struts and open the struts across the uh, circumflex. Now, when you when you do this, OCT is pretty helpful. It tells you which strut you the wire to go through. And this is the uh, design of the uh, strut uh, design of the, the Zines Planty Expeditions. So these are stents which have an out of fit. That means the peak is aligned to the trough and it is in between. So you need to, when you need to cross, you select a cell which not have a connector. So number one, we know that when you are doing a provisional stenting to go through the distal strut, and also we need to also check that PREF should go through a strut which does not have a connector. Otherwise, when you sell with the connector, you will leave the connector behind. You will not be able to compress. So this was the strut which was uh, taken because there's absolutely no link. The red dot shows there was no link. So this was the optimal site for the re. We also check for recross uh, with the wire. Here you can see there is one wire into the side branch, and as we are coming from the proximal. This wire is now coming in. So through the distal uh, strut, the wire is now just entered. So it has entered through the distal. Having crossed that, we chose a 3.5 and a 3 balloon. Did the patient. Now this is a 3D view. You can see the guide wires. One going into the LED, second going into the circumflex. It has distal strut because it is hugging the distal uh, 
wall of the uh, circumflex uh, of the structure to the circumflex ostium. This is the circumflex ostium. Dilated, you remove all the metal and the ostia is so well seen and the air has fallen back. So this is the guide catheter. This is the left main and struct and everything has fallen back. So you very well uh, uh, ended the side branch ostium. The expansion indicator shows that the stent is red. And when we took individual images, this is the guide wire, which is going circumflex guide wire into the main branch. So the stent is absolute expanded with a very optimal uh, result. And this is final uh, run, which showed a uh, vended and a well completed uh, OCT. So no medial dissection, well opposed, and uh, the uh, stents are uh, expanded. So the key points which I need to bring to your notice are that uh, we feel that OCT based increases the contrast load. It takes a lot of time. It also increases radiation. It helps you reduce radiation exposure because you get a lot of information. It helps you cut down the procedure time because it improves your understanding. So one complete run will give information that uh, you will need lesser number of angiographic runs and you save the patient trust. You save the patient as well as the cath lab staff from the radiation. So contrast usage definitely comes down and I've been very strongly advocating very long time. Um, more than the, you leave, leave a very optimized vessel and uh, when you leave an optimal, I mean an optimally deployed stent, you got a good long-term results which will be free of uh, failures because you've taken into account all the keys which lead to stent failure. I mean, it gives you such fantastic details that you will really be, uh, you know, um, assured that your stent has been well deployed and as long as he is compliant medication and controls the other secondary risk factors, a good uh, and with this, I come to the end. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Uh, sir, do you can I ask a question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, bifurcation, uh, 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 when you showed, uh, will it change the once if there is, uh, like if you and you find that uh, the, there is the much uh, struck coverage of branch, then would that change the strategy to do a uh, send a uh, report uh, later on? <clears throat> so I, I tell you, it's a burning. So it's a burning issue whether you're showing the struts, uh, the side branch ostium or not. I, I use one very simple. Strategy. I showed this just to, in this case, I showed just to illustrate as to how you cross uh, side branch ostium the OCT. But I'm here advocating that if you deploy stent circumflex, you should go ahead and remove. No. When do I remove cross the side branch ostium? Cross the when I have stented the left L6 ostium is when I have got a dominance are coming out of it. When I know that LAD which I where I have in the stent is even though it's supposed to supply 60% of the myocardium, in this case it's supplying only 30% because it is supplying the damaged heart, whereas the circ territory is live. So in these situations, I remove cross. I would not like any new ingrowth or uh, platelet deforming over these struts. But otherwise, if I'm doing a normal healthy who's got normal LV function, the territory is viable. I don't uh, go on and remove the uh, struts uh, from the circum as long as it is not so a dominant. The rhinal system. shift and the block shift, the the, the B, B C the, the, that you okay, mentioned actually. I, right. I completely forgot. Okay. So, yeah. no, I'll give you very simple clues for that. And there was time limitation and you know asking, I'll give you very simple clues. The most important thing once you've done OCT make out whether the side glued or not, concentrate on two or three. Number one is the side branch MLA. If the side branch MLA is less than three five, you have to be careful. Two is the main vessel segment opposite the origin of the side branch. If the main vessel segment opposite the origin of side branch plant more than 50%, you have to be careful. Then the plaque will shift into the side branch. Now, if I'm dealing with a calcified and if I see opposite a circumflex in the left main, there is a big calcific nodule, yeah. correct? I will go for 2 g because now there will be yeah. carinal shift. Because the stent, when it expands, will shift the yeah. carina down. Understand, if there is a plaque, percent there will be, because the plaque will now move the conferential into the side branch and will side branch. Whereas, if there is a calcific nodule, it will push yeah. the carina down. So, three things to be noted. Point number one, the MLA of your side branch ostium. Point number two, the main branch segment opposite branch ostium as to what is the extent of plaque and if there is a calcium there, what degree of uh, shim there opposite the origin of side branch. So there can be plaque shift, there can be carinal shift and both these will get magnified if there is already a plaque burden on the side branch. So can I can I ask one more question now? You know. Yeah, please, please. So today please. when we are uh, to, today when we are doing STEMI, imaging, and when we implant a stent, now do that we should do imaging of this to do PCI optimization. Well, I heard that you are doing yes. that. Yes, so I would I, like I, your uh, opinion and what are your results? You know? 
So I, it's been an eye opener. Uh, uh, we started it as a small pilot project and we, we are yet to analyze, uh, write this paper down. What we've noticed is that the optimization is much required. Now there are multiple when you're doing a STEMI, you know, vessel size assessment becomes very, especially patients who have uh, come in cardiogenic shock or who come with considerable thrombus, because at the end of the day, it thrombus is just kind of size of your vessel and it's just a luminogrite undersized the stent. Two, there is so much of catecholamination that it causes vasospasm, not only the infarct related artery of the other vessels. Now you liberty of using uh, vaso in this situation to, you know, ethically assess and um, what conventionally we feeling is that use like the size 10 but don't pour to very high pressures because thrombotic milieu even a thrombus if you do a lot of portion then you'll spend two hours pumping churin down the vessel you know churin is your adenosine diltiazem and nicorandil and all the cocoin and which will be you know uh, minister of adrenaline so all uh, this to open the microvasculature so the central premise of doing primary angioplasty has been use minimal cost, quick in quick out and then once the patient is stable go back and optimize there is a little challenge in this in terms of cost because uh, uh, the relatives will not be for a second procedure in uh, chances. So you have to extend. I, I personally feel that if you talk to them in advance and I brief, this is what you're going to do. And uh, I, I mean, results are there. Now doing is OC acute stretching when the patient table is STEMI doesn't make sense. Uh, in the thrombotic, not going to add much uh, into you. It's not going to tell you much. So it makes the job tougher. Having said that, there are a couple of cases um, OCT has been uh, full. Uh, these are where you have ectatic vessels, situation where the thrombus burden is not. These are situations where, in situation, you uh, you don't know what size tend to be used. I recently, about two weeks back, did see a, which was kind of a weird ectatic, and it opened was no thrombus, and I ended up putting five millimeter stent. I put a five millimeter, uh, and um, thereafter, I was quite certain I had to do OCT in setting only because I was whether my position is correct or not. So I, I mean. Acute setting OCT means a little less, but in one might need, but going back, it's revealing, it's really revealing. And you will see numbers getting resolved. Your stents are mad, your stents are under expanded. You learn edge dissection. It's, it's an eye opener. So after how many days you will suggest so we that we should do the. Generally try and, try and do it within the index admission within four or five days. And, but this really will be dictated by the thrombus burden also. So catching them in the index admission period is uh, the, because once you discharge, you're not, because uh, there's no longer got any pay, doesn't feel that. Uh, the necessity of second procedure. I have done um, once back a live transmission of an ISR. The patient got in a 2.75 millimeters developed ISR during an ACE. He came back again with uh, ISR and got a three millimeter stand. And when I did this live, it just expanded with a four millimeter in NC balloon and put a drug eluting. So the vessel was four millimeter because he came with the ACS, he received a 2.75. And when the stent failed, he received a three millimeter stent of, into the disease as they extended the stent in the proximal part. But when we did owe him, we realized, and in RCA, as you know, there are not too many branching out. So the proximal and distal down change dramatically. Measure RCA proximally of a particular size, then with PLB bifurcation, you can blindly go ahead with the same size and address it. So, sir, in your uh, study and your preliminary experiences, can you tell in how many percentage uh, of patients you have? I would say that it's the optimize. figures are more than 50 to 60 percent. Oh, lot, sir. Yeah, it's a lot. I'm telling you, it's, it's yeah. an eye opener. That's a lot. It's an eye opener. It's an eye opener. So you feel that we should suggest I, the patient I, beforehand I, when I, we are doing I, STEMI. I strongly feel that it needs to be optimized um, within six, seven days. And I, I would uh, request all of those who are in the panel you know, do it once and uh, see what you encounter in your practice. Um, it, it's, it's a learning experience. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, could it be due to the fact that we generally tend to Avoid post validations in a study, like you were mentioning in your uh, initial part of the presentation. You are hesitant to use more than 60 years of the dye in the primary angioplasty. And uh, so, could, could that be one of the factors? What we have been seeing in our cases is we have to uh, get good flow and more time with patient and we stent light and stent boost, which I feel And we are doing relatively aggressive postions and um, uh, even stent patients. Maybe, maybe the practice which we are following may be slant. But uh, falling back again after three, four days, it is it necessary for all for some cases because I have the luxury I, of only for lots and that too on call. Most of the times it is our experience from the past which guides so us. I, I will tell you, Samir, it's not in all cases. I, I won't say across the board. Uh, dictates mm, optimum is the thrombus burden, you know. So what dictates the uh, relook is the um, sizing errors, which are, which are uh, you know, uh, catch. What dictates... Um, Specialization with OCT is you in which you've implanted the stent. What dictates uh, OCT at date or optimization is the hemodynamics of the patient. 
avenide contrast in a given patient in the aspiration is which is very natural to you you know you will um, you open the real coronary vessel i p i am i'm purposefully using the cardial because you're not sure whether you open the microvasculature or not you have opened and you spend energy i have seen operators taking cordal lateral oblins of use demonstrating that i have drastic drop and they get caught one or two hours from the icu that the patient has gone into pulmonary edema in the extreme situations where the patient is being wheeled out he carries while being and they be in the middle are uh, called he is developed hypotension and he is not doing you know these are things which easily be avoided by controlling one variable which is the contrast and keeping the procedure simple so what we uh, call this bit simple you know so that is the central premise we've been advocating very strongly we are doing a primary angioplasty try and use contrastously restrict your views restrict optimizations to great extent because you know time is muscle and the other factor is the hair is not equal to pericardial coronary artery you have concentration the microvasculature the more you finger this vessel which is larger vessel you know cell is another thing if larger vessel because the diameter of the coronary is if you you can a large left main and then you already led appears only 2.5 meter so suddenly a five left main will not taper into a three mil led so this basically tells you started with uh, thrombus you know i have seen people implanting 2.5 mm yeah, stent yeah. so, so uh, what what uh, what i uh, do and most of my colleagues do and we have realized that in an acute especially when the patient is on inorthobus uh, and with the expedient also we and like you said vessel cannot suddenly taper to so probably sizing the stent or maybe slightly a larger stent at a nominal pressure i i mean ones are i is to be very great extent but what if you don't have a receiver what i am telling is not strongly advocating that this is the model what i am telling as a small pilot project we have we've seen this but i i by opening that this has got its own problem getting the patient back as factor there are multiple ways to this so i am not advocating the at all but i said that we we are running a pilot project and we are that these are these are you know problems which you can have while in, uh, uh, in the acs melu of course there there are multiple ways with this and this the uh, strategy which can be promulgated as of various reasons the intervention cost multiple things but yes you have to be two situations sensitive to i i mean the and the given plaque morphology based on that i feel that one can have this option that okay he's all, let me get him back when will and optimize the because he might have to a second procedure but it is from undergoing a second procedure at the end of 6 months so can you please uh, uh, discuss a uh, little more about that malposition of the stent which you showed wherein you could be because of the phantom flex is arising from yes. that point so, so mention the uh, malposition linked to the side region in yes. your terminology so could you please throw some light so what happens is uh, when when the stent goes across a side branch so some portion of the stent will be across a segment of where there is no vessel wall since there is a side branch ostium so the machine automatically will these stent struts red they are not opposed they cannot be opposed because there is a side branch which is on so on the opposition this area will be marked as red but as you see the lumen profile you'll see a dot there now you know that this malopore is because there is a branch which is originating in this area so if i have stented from lad to left main in the segments of the stent which is opposite the ostium complex i will see marking on the opposition indicator basically tells me and when i go in the clinical images i will see a strut marks so that doesn't mean malopos- there is malposition but not correctable and it is secondary to a side can, branch can, can, can this lead to confusion if you have an ostial led stent uh, the reason i'm asking oh. is i had a case uh, a month back where in uh, really i have stented the led and he came to morphosis following stoppage of and uh, he was a drug addict so emergency somehow i was able to some flow but uh, to a thombus burden i put him on f6 next day i took him for the uh, yeah. thing. i established a flow just left it there, as you rightly said to preserve the microvasculature We decided to know the cause for stent failure, and uh, then we had to get three millimeter stent up to four millimeter. The person who was assisting me, he basically showed uh, probably that this has slightly moved into the left. I don't know about it. So I know that if you have an ostial LED stent, and that male position was of the circumflex originating from the. I mean, I can share with you in those OCT areas. No, no. Can you guide something? No. See, in the safe, you have. I told you, stent starts the left main across the circumflex on for about two millimeters or three millimeter. Be the. Uh, for uh, the stent thrombosis number 1 the clinical study have not proved malposition the cause of stent thrombosis the expansion can be a cause of stent malposition has not been clearly malposition can be actually late acquired late acquired is because the thrombosis is resolved or the thick material is gone so it cannot that you know so it does figure very high in the things where uh, your thrombosis is taking place now the other important thing which you must remember when you um, who the true ostial place to come into the left main across the circumflex os but what is equally important on is to see whether proximal landing zone whether there are sections noted in the left main 
because when you do these high uh, dilatations many what happens that we end up in the uh, left main and that nidus for thrombus formation and that leads to end thrombosis i have had one or two cases where i did the true ostel led plate high pressure balloons and patient while i was doing the other vessel i check shoot for this thing and i saw all of thrombus sitting in the left main ct there was a clear dissection in the left main uh, segment so i mean it is multi stent failure is multi factor as you pointed out in your case 3 mm stent which was jutting in millimeter left main maybe for extra coming under extent in a person who is not with medication this can does for thrombus formation and can cause stent thrombosis and since you had an early stent thrombosis it, it probably reflects that proximal end of the stent which was malo in the absence of antiplatelet became the nidus for uh, thrombus and that led yeah, to it was after thrombosis. 10 months actually and he was a drug addict and he just stopped his uh, ticagrelor and Uh, what happened actually was he came at about eight o'clock in the evening, and I was able to close the lesion. It was such a thrombus. The only I ultimately went was a whisper. I took a two millimeter vessel over a whisper. I feel that I went underneath that, and then finally somehow I negotiated BMW after that. What I did was gave him epsiximab, dilated it, and just made a kept him on epsiximab for twelve hours. The next day, and then with the OCT, I advised to dilate up to four millimeter vessel, three millimeter stent. I had RCA also in the same sequence. The RCA stent. Okay. The problem was in the LED stent. now these are difficult things all all said and done because um, you get into you know when a patient is hemodynamic stable and uh, your wires are not good so these are difficult situations i am quite with you because whatever it requires to maximize the results and i always advocate that rather than up and giving too much account always good to use the um, help of fp and come back and uh, even lesion because it would have come much uh, better by then and that's what you did thank you sir any other questions anyone right uh, sir so if no other questions uh, dr chadda on uh, behalf of entire team mapit i would like to thank you for imparting your knowledge and your expertise with all of us so these two days i am sure that the participants present here will second my your teachings will definitely help on corporate oct in their route test and also in their journey the uh, precision pci so much sir thanks a lot uh, taking us uh, through these two days and the uh, three people whom i would like from our team uh, for putting up there is uh, ashwini arushi and uh, this they spent substantial time putting this together for us uh, so thanks for all their efforts uh, thank you dr chadda once again for taking us through this no, I, i really enjoyed all thank you team uh... Uh, but uh, for putting this uh, together and uh, we are in for fighting sessions and i would certainly be showcasing some more interesting cases it's just the beginning we have a long way and i thank participants for their active uh, you know participation for generous discussions which we have learned from each other we learn together and that's how it goes in intervention cardiology thank you. thank you so much sir it was a pleasure thank listening you. to you yeah. not only your expertise but your humility as well thank you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you to each and everyone thank you team abbot thank you, thank you. Thank you.